Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar for Drive Sweden's thematic area meeting, business models and policy development. Before we get started, just some do's and don'ts for the meeting to run smoothly. Make sure that your microphone is muted throughout the meeting, that your camera is turned off, and that you, uh, we would love for you to get some questions for our lovely speakers today. So please write in the messaging function if you have some great questions. Shortly before we start today's event, we would just like to introduce for those of you that are new to us at Drug Sweden, what and who we are. We are one of 17 strategic innovation programs and we work with digital automated and shared mobility systems. Our vision is to ensure that Sweden takes a leading role in creating future mobility systems for people and goods that are sustainable, safe and accessible for all. And this wouldn't be possible without our fantastic finances, Vinova, the Swedish Energy Agency and Formas. And what we do is we drive the development towards sustainable mobility solutions by both creating and demonstrating efficient, connected and automated transport systems. We wouldn't be able to do this without our fantastic partners. And as you can see, we engage all types of actors within the triple and quadruple helix perspective. We have cities, OEMs, academia, we have uh, software companies, consultancy agencies, and many, many more. And this wouldn't be possible for us to continue with without our expanding partnership throughout the world. We work in two ways. We work both within our program activities and our project activities. And the event today is one of our program activities, looking into our workshops and conferences, but it also includes then of course our thematic groups, our international collaboration and work, and also competence and matchmaking building. So these program activities also feed into our project activities where we're able to work both through um, specified open calls, but also through our strategic projects. And of course, then the results and takeaways, uh, they feed back into our project activities, which keeps this ever going loop of development. We work within five thematic areas to ensure that we incorporate all the aspects of the future mobility system. These five you have on the right side here and the two that we will be focusing on today is business models and policy development. And before I give the word over to the studio, I would just shortly like to mention and um, encourage you, of course, to apply for our Dry Sweden Open Call for 2022 and 2023 with the theme Innovations for Sustainable, Safe and Accessible Mobility for People and Goods. It opened now on uh, May 18th and the deadline will be on the 2nd of November. So if you would like some more information about this, please head over to our website or just contact us and we would happily speak a bit more about it. So thank you so much for me at the moment and I will hand it over to the studio, Kenzie, Eric and Michael. Yes. Hello everyone. <clears throat> Good to see you. Uh, almost. But uh, we, we have a lot of people registered for the meeting. And uh, the purpose of those thematic meetings, they are networking and information sharing. But we have also a process where we want to identify issues that we can take collaborative actions on and then produce results together. And the energy, as uh, uh, Josephine has presented, is to put uh, projects and strategic projects and open calls. So we uh, want in this meeting to identify the main issue. Nikel, what is that? Thank you. Uh, as you know, Drive Sweden uh, has a focus on uh, future mobility. And in future mobility, we will have autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles will have to share data. Uh, share data with other vehicle brands, but also with other devices and basically share data with anything. So shared data is a hot topic, and when you share data, that will provide an ocean to tap into when it comes to developing new services and developing new services based on new business models. 
that is why we have uh, this shared data focus for today. So uh, we will start with listening to Erik Vetter. Erik Vetter is uh, uh, from Stockholm School of Economics. He's heading one of the projects in, in uh, Drive Sweden, focusing on the key elements of a business model successful rollout of robotaxis. He has also deep insights about the data standards in the EU Commission. So, Eric, please. Okay, thank you. So, I will actually run my presentation here. So, let me know when you see my slides. Yep, put no, it in presentation mode. Yep, we see it. Okay, might be a, a slight lag. All right, <clears throat> so thank you. So I have a few minutes and I'll start by uh, elaborating on uh, what Mikael said. So I'm working with this project, which is a, a strategic one year project uh, for Drive Sweden. Uh, so it's an applied research project in a way being conducted here at the House of Innovation at Stockholm School of Economics, but then also uh, with support and input from the Swedish uh, Traffic Verket, Traffic uh, Authority, Göteborg Stad, Gothenburg City, uh, where there's a lot, which is one of the leading clusters on, on automotive and robotaxis in Sweden, and then SET, the China Euro Vehicle Technology. Uh, so just to give uh, an overview, uh, so when we talk about business models and rollouts of robo-taxi, uh, the common approach, uh, if you're a planner or an engineer, is, of course, to, to use a data-driven approach. So you look at the hard factors. So if you want to roll out in a city, you look at the population, the demographics, uh, the city planning, uh, how does the uh, commuting and vehicle statistics look, and then sometimes you also then do some assumption based on these sort of consumers uh, and their adoption willingness. So if you roll out robotaxi, obviously then uh, consumers would have to switch their current behaviors from driving cars or riding public transport into riding robotaxis. Uh, and this is uh, the basic data-driven approach to planning uh, launches, rollouts, and then also of course the related investment. So how much time and effort do you need to spend? Um, how do you develop then the business model and the business case uh, for robo taxi and this is intuitive and of course the baseline uh, and this is how you should do it uh, however what we then know from other big rollouts from mobility as a service from the, the ride sharing from electric scooters uh, and other big infrastructure uh, investments is that what does also matter uh, are the soft factors and by soft factors, I don't mean you can't necessarily put numbers on it, but it's more of a way to sort of oppose it to the, the classical data-driven approach. So I'm a management researcher, so in management, we often say the soft stuff is the hard stuff. So specifically when we talk about robotaxi launch out, some, some soft factors that could complicate these rollouts or at least the planning of these rollouts, is and i'll go through this in detail it's uh, preference falsification it's cyber risks it's political risk and uh, finally we'll talk more about uh, technology and, and data standards so if we just go through some of these uh, soft factors that one then has to sort of take into account when you plan a robot taxi case rollout either if you're the operator or if you're the city or region that's gonna uh, support these rollouts so the first challenge is what's called preference falsification. And this is a psychological principle that's gotten a lot of attention research, uh, recently. And, and the challenge here is that people, when asked, when, when you do polling or interviews, tend not to state the real preferences and what they actually think. And this is especially strong if we talk about politically correct topics, such as in the US, whether people would vote for Trump or not, all the polls underestimated how many people would vote for Trump. Uh, another closer example is buying ecological uh, food stuff. When, when consumer surveys are done, everybody says that they will, of course, buy uh, near produced and ecological food stuff. But then if you look at the sales numbers, people don't. 
So preference falsification means that people tend to answer on surveys what they think is the right answer or what makes them look good. Uh, and this uh, then can lead to overestimation of willingness to adopt new good behaviors. So very simply put, if people are asked whether they would switch to riding in robo taxis because of all the good stuff that comes with that, uh, saving environment, traffic efficiency, all of that, according to preference fal falsification, people are likely to say yes, even though in reality they will not, or they will do it much, much later. Practically, what this means if you plan a rollout is that the uptake and the switching behaviors might take much, much longer time than you initially estimate. Uh, and if one doesn't take this into a new product launch account, then maybe one runs out of uh, resources or time before the critical mass has, has been adopted. Uh, another thing is cyber risks. Uh, so when we talk about robo-taxi, uh, automotive vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, mobility as a service, uh, they're all going to be part of critical infrastructure. And, and this is just some uh, recent and, and older media snapshots uh, that cyber risks are becoming not only sort of a marginal thing or an added thing or a footnote, but it's really becoming a key issue in everything that has to do with digitalization. So one can't roll out new digital products and services and then sort of leave the cyber risks to the IT department or fix that later. It has to be uh, security by design. Uh, and when we talk about robotaxi, there is a lot of uh, areas of vulnerability. I mean, it's everything from the electric infrastructure. If we assume robotaxis are largely going to be electric vehicles, uh, so hackers have just taken down the uh, infrastructure. Electric grids in the U.S. have been uh, open to big attacks. If you can't charge the cars, they're just going to grind to a halt. Uh, there's been a lot of examples of the actual vehicles being hacked. Uh, and then we've also had data breaches on the operators uh, because then operators are going to sit on very sensitive personal information about uh, people's preferences, mobility, where they go. So, so cyber risks, uh, it, it's not just a, a risk. It's, it's an integrated feature in any type of robotaxi business model. Uh, with that goes the investment, the, the insurance, uh, and just how to build that in. Because again, one of these, and uh, if we look at these media snapshots, a rollout, a billion dollar rollout that runs into one of these uh, ransomware attacks or cyber could basically probably kill that launch, if not the whole company uh, as such. So it, it is a major risk. Uh, another uh, pretty tricky one is, is political risk. So uh, if we, if you see the photo there, uh, the burning cars, uh, that's a, a snapshot from Paris when uh, they, that's similar to how it looked when they rolled out electric scooter and normal ride sharing services in Paris. Taxi drivers have fought with the police. They have blocked car, uh, blocked roads, uh, destroyed property. Uh, so we can imagine what's gonna happen in Paris when a real robot taxi service uh, rolls out. Uh, so, I mean, certain countries have a political tradition of reacting uh, to new products and services, especially if, if jobs are threatened. Uh, also, media has a tendency to maybe uh, overemphasize uh, accidents related to robot taxis can lead to political overreactions. Uh, and similarly there, if one doesn't take into account uh, this into planning the timeline of a launch that potentially an accident or a political overreaction could lead to a total lockdown for one or two years or a delay of a rollout, again, that could kill what could potentially be a, a successful launch. Uh, again, one example that's close is just to see what's happened with the electric scooters, the micromobility uh, those rollouts have started and then progressively they've been pushed back with zones and uh, different types of regulations and restrictions. Um, so it's quite feasible to assume that their original sort of business models have had to adjust along the way. So fortunately for them, they're very capital intensive and have raised a lot of capital. But if they didn't, uh, they, some of them might probably go, go out of business. Uh, and this also then ties over to regulation, which is closely related to the concept of technology standards. 
So, and I, I'm, I'm giving a very high level overview. And I know that there are many people in this call who have sort of deep technical and detailed knowledge about this. Uh, so feel free to fill in in the Q&A. This is mo mostly uh, an overview for people who are not um, sort of day-to-day -day familiar with this. So uh, an easy illustration of technology standards is electric plugs. As you know, sometimes if you travel, you have to buy uh, adapters or you can't use your plug. And that's because there are national or regional technology standards for electric plugs. And in the electric plug case, those standards have persisted. So most countries have their own or, or most regions keep their own for various, for various reasons. In other cases, what's quite common is a technology battle or a standards battle. And a famous example historically is the videotape, the beta versus VHS. So when the videotapes came along, there were two standards. So you could buy players and tapes that either looked like the beta standard or the VHS standard. And that turned out to be quite inefficient. So there was a huge technology battle that then the VHS standard won and became the global standard. So after that standard battle, all the manufacturers of the beta products had to switch to, to VHS. So obviously a huge win for the sponsors and the originators of the VHS standard and, and a loss for the sponsors of the beta standard. And to see how this has looked in mobility, actually the whole mobility sector is, is heavily influenced by standards. And also just to show the fact that standards uh, are very persistent is the fact that modern railways uh, still use the standard gauge that was a, a technology standard that was set in 1827. Uh, so before uh, in, the, in the 1800s, there were different countries had different standards, but then there was a standard battle. So the standard gauge rail became the global standard and, and most uh, railways had to adopt to that. Uh, the fact that rails are made of steel and the quality is uh, a technology standard. The way that the flanged wheel is designed is a technology standard. So still <clears throat> modern day trains and the railway industry is still operating within standards that are over 150 years old. So, so standards can have a huge impact and become sort of the rules for how an industry can operate. Um, another example, if you're familiar with the uh, London taxis, uh, they have a weird shape with a, a sort of a high, high ceiling, which is very comfortable. But there is a reason why they all look like that. And that's a standard that was set also uh, quite some time back. And, and the standard was that in order to operate a London taxi, a gentleman had to be able to ride in the back with a bowler hat on. So uh, that's the reason why modern day London taxis still look that because they still have to conform to the bowler hat standard. So again, maybe some funny examples, uh, but the point is that standards have a huge impact on the direction and evolution of industry and then become the, the rules uh, that companies uh, have to conform to. And then finally, then diving into what M Miguel was saying. So we now see in robot taxis, we see that technology standards are evolving and these technology battles are happening specifically relating to data transfer. So one of the highest profile uh, data battle, the standard battle that's currently happening is the V2X, vehicle to everything standard. And that is, as was mentioned before, that uh, these smart vehicles, robot taxis, are going to have to communicate with the networks, with other cars, with cities, and also with the uh, sort of booking apps and the, uh, the people, the passengers. Uh, and there are two main standards for this data transfer. And one we can call the Wi-Fi standard and one we can call the 5G standard, just to keep them apart. Uh, so the Wi-Fi standard was originally sponsored by the US uh, government, the Federal Trade Commission. They have some sponsors. Uh, some of the high profile ones are Volkswagen, General Motors and Toyota. But then we also have the 5G or the mobile standard where it's a bit simplified, uh, the sponsors are the European Commission, Airbus, Apple, Geely, Ford, Samsung, and loads of other companies then. Uh, and now it seems like uh, there is a beta versus VHS battle over this data standard happening. So there is a lot of lobbying and regulation going on. And some of the major manufacturers like General Motors and Toyota are now preparing to potentially launch products that can conform to both these standards in case there are going to be regional differences. 
So one could imagine a scenario where the 5G standard uh, is the data transfer standard in Europe, whereas the Wi-Fi standard could be dominant in the US. Or what also could happen, as we know historically, is that there's going to be a major data standard battles happening, and one of these standards is, is going to be uh, the global standard. And of course, if one is investing in technology, technology development or product development in this area, this is something you want to keep an eye out for, because it could, if you invest hundreds of millions or billions, you want to know that the products or technology you invest in uh, is not going to be canceled. Uh, obviously, this is highly technical. So I think like the, the companies and people who are involved in the V2X standard are, are way more knowledgeable um, than me uh, about this. Uh, but another standard that's also going to have maybe a broader impact, and that's the, the standards for data sharing with outside actors. So there is now two uh, so high profile initiatives in this space. So one is the Open Mobility Foundation in the US. So this is uh, a lot of big cities, Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, uh, that have banded together and set a standard, the mobility data standard, and said that if you're a mobility provider, micro mobility or robot taxi or ride sharing, you're gonna have to share data with the city you operate in according to this mobile data standard. Um, and, and that's so that the city can then uh, get the information that they need for compliance, for, for traffic management, and for other things. So this is a U.S. standard, but we, uh, in the, uh, we can see that this is spreading. So, for instance, Lisbon in Portugal and Amsterdam are both adopting some kind of data sharing standard that, that builds on this open uh, mobility and the MDS standard. And in parallel, uh, European Commission launched their new strategy for data and AI recently. And in that new digital strategy is uh, the concept of uh, data spaces. So the European Commission have identified a couple of areas where they say that in these areas, we want to see shared data to support innovation, entrepreneurship, to support uh, public good, uh, science, everything. And one of these nine strategic areas is then mobility. So the EU has plans uh, to regulate and build the common European mobility data space. Uh, so there are components of this already in the transportation sector, but their vision uh, is to have one huge European uh, data lake, basically, where all mobility providers, companies, and actors have to share their data in some aggregated or standard form. So uh, both of these are evolving and, and uh, happening sort of in parallel. And there is also, I, I think we might hear, but there is also discussions and dialogue between these initiatives. But I think that both the mobility data standard and the EU's common uh, mobility data space is gonna be boundary setting for any company, uh, whether one is an operator or a manufacturer in the mobility data space uh, in the years to come. Uh, I think I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Eric. Um, and uh, we have some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and I start with the first one. Uh, based on, on your experience, Eric, who will be the major driver for mobility data standards? Will it be the authorities or will it be the market? That's a very good question. Uh, I should say, I mean, based on my experience, uh, I only have, uh, we're halfway through the project. So the project is intended to uh, figure this out. But one can say it's, um, it is a little bit a difference between cultures. So if we simplify it and we say in, in Europe, Europe has a tradition of government regulating. And that's what we see. The European Commission is uh, sort of intending to regulate this top down and then give member states uh, sort of guidelines, uh, which then become national regulation. So I think the European Commission, their idea is that they're going to regulate it. If we look at the US, traditionally, it's been the market industry has sort of just done things and then that's become the standard. And I think what's interesting about the uh, MDS, the mobility data standard, is that that's a little bit, uh, one, some people are saying that's a reaction in the US 
against the market dominance. So there's been um, some major players have just rolled out. And then as a reaction, uh, the cities have banded together and created like a, a union <laughs> and said that if you want to operate here, you will have to conform to this standard that we're setting up. So it, it's kind of a, it's not a federal government initiative, but it's a city uh, led initiative. Uh, and I think what's interesting is we've, uh, in the US, there's also then been lawsuits against this from some of the big companies that don't want to conform to this. Uh, but those lawsuits uh, have been uh, recently lost and thrown out. So, so it seems like it is, uh, yeah, I don't know how to categorize that. So it's not really market driven, but, uh, but it's not a government uh, initiative. It's somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Um, in the end, um, I guess it's going to be, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see because what's happening now in these standard forums is that obviously then both governments and market players are trying to uh, shape the process. And that's what we see in the V2X standard. So I don't have a good answer yet. I, I hope to know more and at the end of the year, maybe. But, but, but we, if we spin on, on um, the development in US and you mentioned the Open Mobility Foundation where cities kind of gather together to establish, let's call it local standards. Do you see that Europe is moving in the same direction and, and does that require that automakers will be forced to, to adopt to potentially many different and potentially even conflicting standards? Uh, I think it's at, uh, I mean, it's both the cities, but I, I mean, uh, I saw we had RICE here. RICE is actually a, a member of uh, the Open Mobility Foundation, so maybe we'll get even more information there. So it's not just cities, but indirectly, I mean, uh, Sweden is also a player in that standard. But but to your question, I think that's the, uh, I mean that that's the evolution of standard battles is that over time, if you have a timeline, what you usually see is you have national or regional standards popping up, but then over time, since that's so inefficient and and costly, there is usually a pressure to align those standards or to come up with global or regional standards. So, uh, I mean right now there is the MDS and we have the European initiative, it could happen that those align and become very similar or, or the same one over time, just because it is more efficient. Uh, where you see the national or competing standards is usually when you have uh, sort of some protectionistic again agenda behind it. So some kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of governments trying to protect their industry against competition. Whether we're going to see that here, I'm I don't know, actually. I mean, that's, um, uh, again, I hope to. This is why it's interesting research. If, if I knew the answer, I would uh, not have to do research. I would just invest money. But uh, since we don't know the answer, it's, it's a very interesting research topic. Good. OK, uh, we don't have any other questions. Do you have? I think we could uh, switch over to Daniel Rudmark from RISE, because uh, I know that Daniel is also involved in the OMF, but he will first talk about uh, a project called Odin. And Daniel Rudmark from RISE, he has been involved in data sharing, mainly for public transport, but uh, sharing open data with the public since many years. So a very experienced speaker. Please, Daniel. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Kent Erik, for that uh, nice introduction. OK, so. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about a network of actors uh, that we call ODIN. Uh, that is an abbreviation for Open Mobility Data in the Nordics. Uh, and sort of, the, I would say that one core objective of what we do is that uh, we tr see how we can scale data sharing and data sharing solutions across the Nordic countries. And today I will talk a little bit about more of what we do in ODIN and then spend some extra time on the standardization efforts that we have been undertaking for, for quite some time now uh, within Odin. So uh, maybe following up on Eric's previous presentation in that regard.
Okay, so these are the organizations that currently participate within Odin. Uh, we have uh, representation from Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, and also Estonia. And you could say that uh, uh, these organizations, I would say that they have either one out of two capacities, either they collect and publish data on some sort of national function, or they are a public authority overseeing uh, that data is published in the way that it uh, should be, according to different uh, regulations. And when we talk about, uh, I mean, why are we, uh, why are we collaborating here? I would say that we usually talk about that we have a threefold purpose. Uh, and the first one is that we would like to make it easier for those who have new innovative uh, mobility services, and maybe they can launch this service in one country. It should be easy also to move it out to other countries as well. And that is, I think, what sort of got us started to work in this collaboration. Then we also, the second one has to do with how we can leverage different types of policies or EU regulations. And uh, honestly, I think this has been sort of the prime driver for the more concrete actions that we have done so far. And uh, there are already uh, upcoming and in effect EU regulations stating that if you have certain data categories like timetables or, or public transport networks in a digital form, they must be published. Uh, and we know that you know being compliant will require a lot of work uh, and we want to use that work not just to be compliant but also to do something that can be actually beneficial uh, for both these organizations but also for, for other parties as well and if we succeed with these first two uh, we hope that uh, yeah maybe we can play a part in establishing the nordics as a living lab uh, if you look at the outcomes, I mean, what have we, what have we done so far? Uh, you could describe that there are four types of outcomes from this collaboration. So the first one is, of course, knowledge sharing. I think that we have uh, different specialities across the Nordics, uh, uh, and the, the 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 knowledge has been unevenly distributed. So we have talked a lot about that. Uh, we uh, have an upcoming workshop. We have talked a lot about standards. There are a myriad of different European standards uh, that is important to share knowledge about. Uh, uh, we also have a workshop upcoming in a couple of weeks on how we can create infrastructure or architecture, systems architectures, where we can share components in a better way. So that's one thing. Uh, the second one is that we have used this network as a synchronization for policy issues. So uh, there are often a lot of ongoing regulations and uh, policy suggestions uh, where the different EU member states are asked to come back with feedback. And I think that there has been a sense in this network that it has been difficult as a single Nordic country to have some impact. But if we can speak with a joint voice, so to speak, it has been, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's better. We've also used this as a starting point for more bilateral cooperation. So for instance, now the, there is a uh, a custom-built ticketing system in Norway that N2 has developed that is now being implemented by some of the Finnish organizations that are, are uh, participating and that has sort of branched out of, of this collaboration. And then we have the fourth one, which is more sort of tangible standardization across the Nordics. And that is what I will talk for, yeah, for the rest of this talk about. Uh, yes, so the Nordic Netflix profile. Uh, so what is that? So uh, yes, so I, I, I mentioned previously that there is new EU regulations that require that all member states, if they have this type of data that I mentioned previously, it must be published and it must be published following a standard called Netflix. And this Netflix, it's a quite complex standard, uh, meaning that you can describe the same real world entity in different ways. Uh, so uh, you can, yeah, so what you need to do is that you, you take a subset out of this standard and say that, okay, this is how we describe a bus stop or this is how we describe a timetable, for instance. Uh, and this subset is then called a profile. Uh, and this was something that when we started to collaborate, we knew that this was coming. And I think there were 
quite early on a consensus that if we were to implement Netflix in sort of the same manner, uh, using the same what they call the national profile, it will be beneficial for, for the Nordic market. And since 2019, we have a common Nordic profile when it comes to Netflix. Uh, part one and two, for those of you who are uh, sort of uh, yeah, very knowledgeable about this. And this has then been based on the uh, Norwegian Netflix profile, and it's uh, available on that URL there at the bottom. So it's all open. And uh, here I will uh, talk about why I think we were able to establish the Nordic Netflix profile and three keys to that. Uh, and the first one is, I think that uh, an important thing, and I've been doing also uh, sort of as a research following up, I've been interviewing these actors. And one of the things that they are pointing to is that the, the, it builds on existing verified knowledge because the Nordic Netflix profile, uh, it used to be the Norwegian Netflix profile, and it has been in use there since 2017. Uh, this means that the actors here, they can be quite comfortable with that the use cases that is common within an industry it is supported by the standard. Uh, and, and of course, like Erik was saying earlier, there is always, always competitive standards. And I think that the one that has been perhaps mostly used across the world is GTFS, and it's very powerful. But that is more targeted towards end users. And this then, by using this Norwegian uh, 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 Netex profile, you know that this will have support for the entire value chain and not just for the end users. Uh, and by that, they could be quite comfortable with that this will work for the most common use cases and they don't have to reinvent wheels and so forth. I think the second one, and I think this is perhaps in effect the most important reason for why we were able to do this, is that uh, Entur has been very uh, progressive in in having a, a digital infrastructure that builds on on open source solutions, and by uh, uh, yeah and by uh, taking the Norwegian Netflix profile, you can have compatibility with frameworks. That means that you can actually you can do things with the data immediately. Uh, and one of those things uh, uh, that has been sort of a driver is travel planning. And that is how do you get from point A to point B? And that's a quite complex task to, to write an algorithm for. Uh, and then here, the, um, the Nordic Netflix profile, it is compliant with an open source software uh, framework that is called Open Trip Planner. Uh, and this is used by many uh, uh, organizations, uh, both in Europe, so for instance, uh, Entur, the Norwegian uh, National Travel Planner uses this, in Helsinki, uh, public transport are using this, but also in the US, so like in, in, in Oregon and some of the other large cities are using this framework, so it's a very, uh, it's a very powerful framework in that source. And so they knew that if they would use this uh, Nordic Netflix profile, they know that immediately it can be used. And I think that's the core thing here that, that you can put data into use. Uh, yes, and then I think the third uh, important uh, aspect here is that we were able to establish a balanced governance uh, regime. Uh, and that is because if you have a standard, uh, I mean, of course, it has to be stable. I mean, that's the whole thing of having a standard that you can trust it and, and so forth. On the other hand, the world is changing, so the standard must adapt to that too. And the way we have set this up is that we have uh, the Nordic Netflix profile. It's governed uh, jointly by, you have two representatives from each country. Estonia is not there right now, but it's uh, two people from Finland, Norway, Denmark, and uh, Sweden. Uh, and then we have a set of governance rules uh, saying that, for instance, if you just want to add a field that is not mandatory, it's sufficient that one country asks for it. But if you have a breaking change that breaks backward compatibility, everyone has to agree. So that we can, uh, so that we can have this balance in how we govern this standard, I think has been important as well. Uh, and this means then that those who are uh, participating here, they, they do have the possibility to see where this standard is going, uh, but also that they can use their veto if there is something that they really don't, yeah, against breaking changes, for instance. 
And if you uh, look at where we where we hope that we are going or, or the direction that we're going, I think when we started, uh, we were, I mean, I think all the organizations were uh, working with uh, data sharing in some sorts. Uh, for the last uh, couple of years, we have worked with the standards and how we can uh, yeah, standardize this data. And then the next step is then also to actually use this data. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, here I think that the different organizations have come different far here. I think that some of the organizations are already up on the on the uh, on the top uh, step here in this ladder, uh, where they have much value creation opportunities, and others are still making that transition. Uh, and here I think that it's uh, I think that this is very very important because I think uh, having worked with uh, you know open data and data sharing from from uh, public authorities. There's always a risk that you publish data and it does not get into use. But I think that when you publish data, you do it in a standardized manner and you also use that data uh, yourself. I think that is when you can uh, really, you, yeah, other actors can trust this data. And when you use open source solutions like some of the actors in Odin does, it means that others can also use it. Uh, so I think that uh, that uh, yeah I think that's that, that's a very key key thing here, and I think that this was actually my last slide here. Uh, yeah, and if you want to read more about Odin, you have the, the the URL there. Thank you very much, Daniel. Very good. Uh, we have a few questions. I put one question myself here. And that is, uh, you have a European mandatory standard, and still yeah. you have dialects. Why not have yes. uh, one European dialect? Uh, well, everything you know when you when you lift the stones, everything is more complex. But uh, so what I didn't say here is that there is something called uh, the passenger profile, which all member states are supposed to implement, and that is supposed to look the same across the EU. But that doesn't fulfill the the industry requirements. You need you need you need more details on that, uh, and those details are too difficult, I think, to agree upon. So uh, so that is why you also are allowed to have a national profile. Um, so uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I guess uh, that is the answer to that. So so the wider yeah. context to uh, a lot of actors that is more uh, harmonized. But when you go into yeah. the internal operation of public transport, then it's more yeah, uh, exactly. specific. And I, yeah, and I think that, I mean, if you look at Open Trip Planner, uh, that has been compliant with other standards like GTFS, which is Google's scare standard, and, uh, and that has been used worldwide. But it doesn't provide the level of detail that many of these organizations want. So by instead producing travel options using netdex you can you can provide a much better service for passengers than you can with more sort of general or more or more uh, yeah more abstract standards i would say mm -hmm. Yeah, but Daniel, following the same question as uh, to Eric Wetter, with with those special dialects, mm -hmm. uh, is there a risk that that global actors will be forced to to adopt to several different and potentially conflicting versions of NetEx? Uh, yeah, well, I think that I guess that depends on the 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 level of detail that their service are relying on. So I think that. If you can live with uh, the more the abstractions that the passenger profile is offering, then you have sort of the the entire European market in in one uh, in one um, uh, yeah in one standard. And if you can live with even less details that you can uh, that you can express in the GTFS standard, for instance, well then you can only do one for the whole world. So I I would say that it depends on. The level of detail that your service is dependent on uh, that would be sort of the the, the demarcation here. Uh, so this is the, the lessons learned to uh, to other areas and other mobility uh, solutions that you you have a, a an overview standard that can be shared mm -hmm. for wider and then if you go 
level lower more detailed mm. then it takes more time and more actors will be uh, involved and so on so this yeah. is the way and, I mean, your experience yeah it is my experience and also i mean uh, yeah, and i think that uh, yeah that, that's probably my experience and and following up on the previous questions that were asked in, in Eric's uh, presentation earlier, uh, I would say that, I mean, I mean, fr from my perspective, I think that there are uh, uh, at least three uh, sort of who is driving this standardization. So, uh, I mean, uh, one is then the, the, the global uh, companies. So, for instance, Google has driven standardization of GTFS across the globe so that they can standardize how public transport actors are feeding uh, uh, public transport data into Google Maps so that we can do routing there. So that, that's one way of, of how standardization is going. Then we have sort of the more uh, top down but that we see in EU that there is policy saying that uh, yeah, uh, this is this is what you're supposed to do. And then you have sort of local adaptation from that. And then we have the third uh, that I think was also mentioned earlier um, uh, in in the U.S., where from my point of view, that's very much a, a public-private partnership kind of thing, where cities work. Even though cities have sort of the last word, they work very closely with uh, private actors in order to uh, to get velocity. I think so. Uh, yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, that, that is uh, three ways that I have observed uh, how standardization mm -hmm. is ongoing in this field, at least. And regarding this third way, you, that's OMF, or is it uh, other standardization uh, actions? Yeah, that is uh, the third public. That is how I see that OMF has been working. Uh, and I think also, I think they are a very interesting example because I think they have come very, very far in a short amount, short amount of time. So I think that they have been very efficient in their standardization efforts. And I think that is not something that we can uh, really say that European standardization has been. It's often very long cycles uh, before anything is implemented. And I think there are lessons learned. How can we learn from that type of standardization processes that has been done in the US, I think is, is really interesting. I have uh, from the audience, it's, it's not a question, it's more of a statement. Uh, standardization is the right uh, level, it is key. Too detailed standards may hinder development. What is your comment on, on that? Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I guess that's right. But on the other hand, uh, it depends on, uh, uh, on, I mean, the right level of detail depends on the, the type of actor that you are. And I think there is always a struggle between being generic and being able to express important nuances that is necessary in order to actually do the services that we want. So I, I think that this is a I think this is an ongoing tension uh, that is uh, yeah it's it's, it's uh, I, I don't think that there is a clean cut answer to that, uh, but but something that you yeah but but, 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 but yeah. So, so the right level of detail is, I think, determined of the, the, the service, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you had a, a three-step development slide where you moved from shared yeah. data to uh, open data to open source. Mm. Uh, mm. Do you think there are any specific areas where open source will be more likely to happen in short term? Well, I think that I think that the Open Trip Planner is very, very interesting because it it involves so much complexities and uh, 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 and here I, I, I'm making some in-depth studies of of N2, who has been very uh, they have been very involved in that and I mean what they say is that for instance uh, that there has been a lot of contributions from the private sector into that framework. So, for instance, uh, there have been mass operators that has been uh, doing a lot of work when it comes to demand responsive transport, which I think that the public transport industry has not been so has not so much uh, experience from, meaning that when these changes are pushed into the core, and tour can also start to start to make uh, 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 these types of travel options, including demand responsive transport. So I, I think that if you are able to to build 
uh, a good community around these complex issues uh, and of course where the business models uh, can align uh, I, I think that uh, yeah I, I see much potential in that thank you thank you uh, I think we should switch and uh, move to the next speaker thank you very much Daniel for very good insights and experience and I think you have a lot of more things to tell us as well yeah. and so before we let uh, Peter go I want to remind everyone to uh, shut their cameras off and mute their microphones if you're not a speaker thank you and the next speakers are uh, Johan Hegg from Naira Dynamics and Peter Jär from here and uh, the, for those who don't know about uh, Naira Dynamics it's an AI company very innovative and with uh, very nice technology uh, head office in Linköping and here is the platform standardization body or market driven actor in Europe and Petter you have long experience from uh, the industry with telematics and everything so Johan and Petter very good speakers uh, please give us a uh, presentation of your market driven service and the challenges. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so just checking that you hear me well. Yep, you good. Do, right? very, 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 very well. Uh, so Johan, you will uh, have the possibility to move the presentation forward, right? Can you yes. confirm that works? Yeah. 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 Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to go through our our partnership. Uh, so my name is uh, Petier. I work for uh, Here Technologies and uh, Yuan. Uh, and my name is Yuan Hegg. I am the head of marketing at Naira Dynamics. So today we will uh, present how uh, vehicle software connected to a platform can be used to create safer roads. Show a bit of the partnership between us as a service provider and uh, here as the platform provider and how we can push the services to the market. So basically uh, we got a brief introduction but Naira we are a sensor fusion company focusing really on the nitty gritty details of the of the car using hardware uh, and software in combination to create new value for customers. Yes, and, and you and uh, your sound is not excellent to me. Is that only for me or is, or is it for everyone? Uh, what do you say in the studio? Do, do you hear you one well? If you can uh, in, change mic, it would be better. It's uh, breaking up a little bit. Okay, uh, so you want, if you have an alternative uh, microphone, please please try that. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, so yeah, so he, uh, here technology. So we are uh, location, uh, and we say the leading location platform in the world. Uh, we're a company that comes from the map industry, so we have a, a a global map that is implemented for different use cases in actually most uh, uh, the majority of all vehicles in the world today that use some kind of map technology. I seem to have a problem with my internal mic. So I'm, is this OK or is it really? Yeah, it, no, it's, it, it, it works. It's, it's just a scratchy. Yeah. OK. <laughs> so the, the main principle that we're doing, we, we start in the car where we uh, install a software component. Uh, the software component uses the already existing sensors of the vehicle uh, to produce new type of value. Mainly we focus on the wheel speed sensor, which, because that's very important, the tire and the wheel uh, and the things related to that. Uh, using that software, we can monitor the road surface for road roughness, for road friction, potholes and speed bumps, but also road wetness and temperature. So using only software. Then that data is transferred to the cloud backend. 
the the advantage of the software that we provide is that it can um, use regular passenger vehicles for for uh, collecting that data. So this means you don't have to install any um, expensive hardware or monitoring software. It's just really simple uh, software solutions using the already existing sensors. Um, then when it comes to the to the backend, we we aggregate all the data from the vehicles, anonymize it, of course. Uh, we map match it using the the here so, uh, backend, uh, and then it's published automatically within minutes towards uh, our customers and partners. This means that uh, road surface information, which we call the service, can be it's updated within minutes and all all the time it has a real time map. OK, and then we come to the contribution of uh, here technologies uh, in this business case. So what I've done is that I, I, I put the, uh, the the digital globe uh, uh, in the middle because from our perspective, that's a very important part. Uh, so location, we say, makes sense. So when you have been doing development for many, many years now using timestamps as a very central part of the development, we believe that a latitude and a longitude uh, also makes a lot of sense. And uh, we, we can take a lot of examples of this. Uh, uh, one example is that you use, uh, let's say, the, the attributes of a map that explains that you are passing by a school. And then you might actually have, uh, you, you classify and you, and you analyze the data coming from a vehicle passing a school with different eyes than you do uh, uh, from, from the general crowd data. That's just one example. Another example is that when you want to do um, uh, vehicle maintenance, you might want to cross-reference the data from the vehicle uh, with totally different data types that doesn't come from the vehicle. It could be uh, humidity or, or some kind of weather data. And then you need to have not only a timestamp, but also a location stamp in order to to process this. So in the center of our solution is our digital uh, twin of the of, of the real world. So we mapped all roads uh, all over the world, uh, including difficult Asian markets. Um, we are doing it uh, many times in centimeter precision. Uh, we, we map buildings, uh, indoor, etc. So with this kind of digital map uh, at, at the center, we have built a platform. And when it comes to this platform, um, we, we have divided it into two, two pieces. Uh, and, and, and both are used in this uh, Naira business case where we're working together with Naira. So uh, one piece is the workspace. And the workspace is, the, is, is a place where uh, the smart guys works with the data. They, they upload the data, they analyze the data, they process the data. They store the data, they stream the data, everything is done on the workspace and they get, of course, access to the digital twin, the world, while they are doing all those uh, uh, processing. But they are doing it in a private space. And I think this is very important when we talk about commercialization of, of, and monetization of, of data that it needs to be safe, right? You don't want to work with your data and give it away at the same time. So in our universe, our partners always keep the data. They can license it to us and to others. They can process it and license, license the ready service, but they keep the ownership of their data and they decide all the time and they can switch it off whenever they want. So it's not about giving data. It's not about selling data. It's not about losing data. It's about keeping the data, use it, monetize it and, and keep that control. And it starts in the workspace where you work, uh, where you work with the data and cross-reference it again uh, towards the digital twin. And then the 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 uh, um, the third part is a marketplace, which we will actually uh, look into a little bit more uh, uh, in this presentation. So the marketplace is is our arena, uh, our place where customers can display the data. 
Uh, but also there, they are pretty much protected. So companies can decide to put the data in the marketplace, but not display it. And then they have secret meetings all over the world, exactly like business to business always works. Uh, when it comes to giving access to the data, it happens in the secret. Not even us at here would see it. Uh, but they can display the data in, in the marketplace and say, this data is available. They can give out a sample on the marketplace and say, this is available. But they can also go all the way and say, here's my data and it costs one euro a month if you want to process it, if you want to use it. And they can decide that this is a data that you can download, do whatever you want with. Uh, and it's yours when you have downloaded it. Or this is a data that you can now use uh, you pay for it, you're allowed to use it for the use case that we have agreed on, but it's not your data. You only license it for this use case. And this is important because it goes all the way back to the constant management. Um, to ensure that this work, I mean, uh, uh, I've, I've been, I've been uh, working with uh, data sales for around about 12 years now, I think, and, and uh, all the money, <laughs> Most of the money I, I, I brought into to my companies during these years is, is actually data sales. So, so it works and it, it goes, it, it works with kind of big business and it, it, it works to grow uh, with partners using this model. Hey, Yuan. Yeah, so, so like Peter said, uh, the, the platform is really a, a driver for us. It's uh, where we work with the algorithms and the development of the products the platform the here platform really allows us to to focus on on the things that we do best so that's the the main advantage for for us uh, naira as a company to to be cooperating with here and also it allows us to to collaborate with other data suppliers on the here platform which makes it a lot easier you mentioned standards before uh i mean the platform really acts as a um, helping us with the standards. So just going into some detail about the the results of the cooperation that we have. Um, I mentioned that we use regular passenger vehicles to collect information about the roads. So currently we have around 1.2 million vehicles on the roads. So we have a cooperation with the Volkswagen Group. That's our main data, data supplier. So using their regular passenger vehicles uh, from regular customers uh, driving across Europe, uh, collecting data about the roads. So that's the main data supplier. But then when the data is published, we use the data towards firsthand the road maintenance industry. So pushing the data to road operators, to authorities, to road contractors, to really make the, the maintenance planning better and create safe roads for the, the public. So that's the first step, the road maintenance uh, companies and players. Next step, we push the data back to the cars, meaning in your car, you can have an alert service saying that really replacing the snowflake with a more intelligent snowflake, saying that you're about to enter a slippery area and you should be cautious. So uh, an alert service that actually works. Uh, next step, which is in development, is a navigation service based on alerts, meaning that in your navigation system, you will know beforehand uh, that you're about to enter a slippery area. So not just a warning in your dashboard, but actually uh, an entire map from your trip point A to point B, you will know exactly where the slippery areas are. And one part could be avoiding them or one part could be just slowing down before you enter that area. Next step and in the future, um, this also will be used for autonomous vehicles to actually turn autonomy on or off or set the distance to uh, other vehicles. Uh, today, I mean, when we're doing testing and uh, of autonomous vehicles, that really is done in 
uh, the perfect conditions, sunny conditions. Uh, but here in, in Sweden, uh, that will not work. It definitely will not. And we really need the weather data to, to make autonomy possible in the future. That's a bit brief on what the service can provide. Uh, moving into the uh, challenges for the future. Okay, um, thank you, Juan. Um, so we have uh, three common challenges in, in, in front of us, and, and this is based on, I mean, this, this is, is not uh, a fixed truth. Uh, this is based on my own experience, I would say, or our uh, business experience, where we say normally that we have three uh, uh, big challenges that has to be tackled with totally different people, right? So one is technology. So we need smart engineers and AI experts, platform experts, developers, etc., to make it work. Uh, there are many, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of people in, in, in this call today that, that could do this, that, that could work with this and, and have the techni techno technical skills to, to fix it. Uh, we have the privacy and the GDPR uh, compliance issues or, or challenges. Uh, again, this is an area where we use then totally different people, privacy experts, legal expertise, uh, uh, and uh, we need to go all the way back into the consent many times of the driver in order to be able to use the data. Uh, and then we have the commercial part. And uh, we say we solved uh, all of the parts. Uh, we, we feel that uh, the technical and, and the compliance, the legal compliance parts are, let's say, fully solved. I mean, they will, of course, be better, but they are fully solved. Uh, the commercial part uh, is, is partly solved, and we are now working a lot in uh, finding the right uh, business models. Uh, in this uh, slide here, um, uh, we... Um, we have stated a couple of questions or three questions. And one is how to reach out, how do we protect the product, and how to set the right price. So when it comes to reaching out, uh, we use, of course, multiple channels because uh, I think we are very humble here. We don't know where we will get the fastest growth. Uh, we believe a lot in the marketplace, which I already uh, touched. Uh, I also saw there was a, there was a question in, in the chat about who guarantee uh, uh, the service quality accuracy uh, uh, in, in, in the marketplace? And the answer is that the supplier of the data, right? So if, if anyone in this meeting would like to download and, and work and try uh, the friction data of Naira, um, they would have to agree business to business in between what the data should do uh, uh, and what the data uh, would guarantee. Uh, to ensure a certain price, a certain business model. Uh, at here, uh, we provide uh, the tools to make it happen, uh, the standard agreements, the measurements, uh, the payment solutions. I mean, we have all these kind of things in place. We ensure the, the safety and security of the distribution of the data or the ready services. So when it comes to the marketplace, you can actually put out uh, uh, data dumps. Uh, uh, you, you, you can create APIs and, and, and make it available, or, or you know, raw data can, can be ma made available over the marketplace. Um, API via established players has uh, shown to be a very smart way to get out very, very quick, because you have a lot of companies that knows how to read and understand, uh, let's say, a weather feed or, or, or a traffic feed. And uh, typically, these companies, uh, for them, it's very easy to just take, in the same format, uh, the Naira friction feed and use it as an ad additional source of information for, for their services. Um, Bundle into established products is also a very interesting way forward. So you can take the friction service and, and you can build it into to anything, right? Um, 
a, a, a weather app, a, 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 a traffic app. You can, you can uh, uh, bundle it into maybe a place where you also have uh, uh, accidents, uh, accident information or whatever. Now when we talk about automotive. But I'm sure that the friction service of Naira can also be used to, to help people to not fall and, and, and uh, uh, break a leg and get to the hospital. Right, so that could also be a service, and then you might want to bundle it with some uh, med tech applications instead, or or health uh, apps. Uh, and then you have the customized services. You will always have customized services. You will always have customers that want to have it in a certain way. How do we protect the product? Uh, we protect the product via, uh, mainly via business. To business agreements. So we are really in the B2B. Then that can be B2B uh, to C, uh, of course. Uh, it, it can go pretty many times before it's reached the consumer. Uh, but, but we have seen that this is our focus and that makes it also easier when it comes to legal compliance. So Mainly what we do, uh, we focus on, on that. And another way to protect, of course, than, than, than legal promises is, of course, to have a very robust platform that cannot easily be hacked uh, and that really, that really works. Um, and then, Yuan? Yeah. Yeah. R regarding the, the last part is that we're actually protected via the real-time updates. By nature, actually, uh, and we get. I guess we're a bit lucky in that. Uh, when we talk about the type of data that we work with, uh, live friction, that is only valid for a very short time. We collect it, we aggregate it, then we push it back to the map layers uh, and to our customers and users. In a few minutes, things can change really rapidly. Temperatures can rise. Sun can start shining on the roads. Road operators can put salt on certain roads, or the just the number of vehicles driving on the roads can increase, which means the road surface changes. So, like Peter said, the the security is more important uh, than the um, really the the protection for for the data because in commercial use it's only valid for a few minutes. So even if someone would get access to our data um, to use it it's only valid for a few minutes so we're really protected there um, finally how do we set the right price um, maybe the biggest challenge some some services are already live like we mentioned but some are also about to be launched um, the challenge with working with new services like this which really have not been seen by the public before or by companies in, in our space before, means that setting the right price is extremely important. And potentially, like Petter said, it has to be revised over time to suit both end users and to the, the B2B customers. And in order to set the right price, um, the customers need to consider the cost savings that can be made replacing hardware with software, using simple connected data as opposed to streamed video data, or for road maintenance companies, changing the way they work, reducing manual inspection of roads, really going from manual inspection to automated inspection, or help, which really can help them save a lot of money. So cost savings, I would say, is the main driver for services like this. Um, but the life-saving aspect is, of course, uh, of great importance uh, for a car manufacturers. How do you value providing the best possible alert service uh, that can bring value to drivers in slippery conditions? Or for countries, how do you value having the best possible winter maintenance service that keeps the roads safe? Third, how can we make the drivers understand the value of this new type of product? Maybe we need to reach out to them in a, in a way that we as a small company have not done before. Uh, it's map data on a level that, that we haven't seen before. And 
we have to investigate what the willingness to pay for these kind of services is for drivers. Yes, and, and when it comes to that, and we are running out of time now, but we are wrapping up uh, at the same time. So uh, we believe a lot in the digital aftermarket. And what we, what, we, what we mean with the digital market is that the whole car industry is, is pretty used to selling things to a vehicle after it was produced, right? So you can buy cool wheel sides and stickers and, and cargo stuff and... Uh, whatever, you, you, you can repaint your car afterwards. So you have a big aftermarket. And we believe that the car industry need to uh, implement a digital aftermarket structure. And, and it's a lot of struggling here in the automotive industry, but it will come, it must come. And in this digital aftermarket, we can do things like giving a service like the Naira service uh, for the first winter for free. And then, help the driver to understand that they should pay for a subscription for, for the coming winter. Uh, we can uh, bundle it into things that when you buy uh, uh, the best winter tires from uh, whatever nice brand of, of tires, it comes with one, two, three years, whatever, of uh, uh, digital information also about uh, the friction to... to uh, to create a logical aftermarket product. So there's a lot of things here to, to still to be done. And, and I think I speak for both me and Juan that we are of course happy to, to continue this conversation with any of you here in the call. Uh, you can, you can uh, contact us. Uh, and I think Juan on the next slide, we also have our contact details. Yes. Juan, anything else from your side or? No. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, very interesting talk and uh, presentation, and I'm filling up with uh, a lot of questions. But Mikael, you had one first. Yeah, I noticed uh, that you had three challenges, technology, GDPR, and, and commercial, and you had a checkbox in each of them. So I assume you will have a good uh, answer for this techno technology uh, question. What about censoring in dusty roads? Is it possible? Question mark. Well, that depends on what you what you mean. But of course, yes, it's uh, it's definitely possible because the the idea with the, the services like this is that we don't use any cameras, so we only use the um, like look at the look at the surf the touching point between the tire and the road surface. So we use the internal sensors of the vehicle, mainly the wheel speed sensor, to find out uh, information about the road surface, like <coughs> using vibrations and a lot of other sensors. So we don't have any vision systems, so dusty roads is not a problem. Great. And uh, Petter, you, you were bold enough to answer a question directly during your presentation <laughs> about who is Assuring the data consistency, accuracy, etc., and you mentioned that is the supplier. Yeah. Uh, but if the supplier is assuring data quality, who is liable for false data? And yeah. um, how? How? And the que basically the consequences of false data. And how is the liability managed and handled in the marketplace? Yeah. That's that's a very good question. I, I have difficulties to to answer it without mentioning uh, confidence. Uh, what we work with very often is that we work with confidence of data. So let's take an example that we are saying that a certain road sign is standing on a certain place and it shows 70 kilometer per hour. Then one of our customers passing by uh, with, with a connected vehicle, and this happens today, right now, all over while we speak, right? Uh, this car will detect a 70 sign on approximately the right position. Then we can say the minute after that the confidence of this road sign standing there with a 70 sign is extremely high. But in reality, someone can have been there during the night, could have moved it two decimeters to the right, and the sensor of the passing vehicle would not detect that, would just say, yes, it's there, right? And it's 70. What also could be, which is very common in Germany, is that the road sign was digital and it switched from 70 to 60 
three minutes later, right? So we need to work with confidence of data and we need to build systems where actually uh, at the moment, the liability stays with the OEM, I would say. Or if the OEM can push it to insurance company or to the driver, fine. But we will only answer in the following way. We know that we have millions of errors in our map always. Mm. So we will never guarantee a, a, a faultless product. And I'm thinking in your example with, with, with the sign, and this is not my, my field of expertise, but I, I want to relate it to you on your, your service with slippery roads. I mean, uh, the sign is, is fairly fixed in, in position. Yeah. So the confidence is probably much, 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 much higher than the confidence of a slippery road on a specific area somewhere. How, how do you handle the, the liability in, in that kind of more dynamic environment? So, uh, I, well, I would like to f focus a bit on the, on the technical aspect of it, because we only, um, like for the alert service, if we take that as an example, um, we really need to be confident when we post uh, an alert. So, we can we can only post an alert when we're really certain we need a lot of cars producing information about the roads and we need to aggregate that data to to really know that we have an alert at a certain position and and most importantly uh if we're saying that the roads are not slippery but actually the roads are good that's where the big challenges are coming in for future autonomy, for instance, then we really need to know exactly where the roads also are uh, in perfect condition. Because the alerts I'm not so concerned about. If if we send out an alert uh, for a slippery area when it's not slippery, sure, it can be a problem for the driver, but at least he or she will not have a too high speed. The challenge comes when when we need to say that this road is perfect and you can drive uh, your autonomous car at yeah, the highest possible speed. That's when the challenge comes in and that's when we need even more uh, data from vehicles collecting. Good. I think uh, I'm proud to be Swede and talking about what you have done in Naira. Uh, excellent technology and I know that the quality of those services that you, you have is uh, better than what you do with uh, fixed measuring stations and everything. So I, I know that you have a very cost effective and uh, good system. Now it's more how you can roll it out and reach enough vehicles and package it into a commercial service. And uh, yes. I think that this, this is uh, a good example that can be uh, followed by other examples in, in dry Sweden context and everything. And maybe you could connect your service into autonomous vehicles to uh, geofencing, speed adaptation, and uh, yeah, you could think about what this could uh, contribute to For future sure. mobility. For tips sure. from the coach, right? Yep, tips from the coach. <laughs> but but I, I know that you are working on those issues as well. And, and this is a, a, a good example of a commercial service compared to uh, Odin and what we heard from the public transport driven from another area. So thank you very much, guys, for a good presentation. And as I still have a question from the audience. Okay. It's more of a philosophical question, potentially. Uh, how about cities' higher goals? That is the philosophical part of the question. Of a harmonized traffic system, uh, how do they exist today? And if they do, uh, how do you try to connect to them? I, oh well, that, that's a it's a difficult question. I n I would say no, it does not exist today. Uh, if, if if I think autonomy is really key for that harmonized part to be to be working um, one hundred percent. Um, the infrastructure need to, to be there. The the cars need to be able to be controlled from. Yeah, outside of the vehicle as well. Uh, meaning, I think autonomous vehicles is really 
important for such a, for such a city or society to work? I don't know, Peter, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Now I would like to comment this because I, I, I think this is, is is a good question. I don't know if I understand it hundred percent, but but in in the way I see it. Um, there is a lot of initiatives today that uh, cities want to, let's say, having an eye on the traffic and, and be pretty dynamic in saying where can you drive autonomously and, and where can you not do it. And quite often they have manual systems, uh, hardware and other things in place, right? And I would say this should be solved with software and connected vehicles, namely, or at least to 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 a big degree, so from that perspective, I think uh, the the Naira friction service can be used already today in the city of Gothenburg to actually switch on and switch on road fully automatically. That could be implemented in a few weeks, where we give friction values to all road segments and say, now you need to switch off the uh, uh, E6, right? We we cannot have this speed or we cannot allow autonomous driving at the moment. Um, so, so I believe that these kind of big data solutions is the future. It will solve a very big portion of of, of this need. Good. That's uh, last good, question. Uh, point to take a break, and I think we need uh, fifteen minutes. So we will uh, turn on again a quarter to eleven. So. Quarter to 11, be back for next presentation and uh, the workshop. Yeah, and the next presentation will cover uh, crowdsourcing of data from uh, Nubina, and it will be super interesting. So take your coffee and be back in 50 minutes. So welcome back, and I hope that you uh, have a cup of coffee in front of you. Our next presenter is uh, Mikael Jansson from Nobina, and he will uh, share a project uh, proposal uh, covering crowdsourcing of data. Mikael, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Mikael. From one Michael to another. <laughs> uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present a project idea from um, our side. Uh, maybe get some uh, input from the audience. I will uh, see my first slide. There it is. What we are, uh, what, what I will present is a proposal of a public transport travel assistant based on crowdsourced traffic information. And I have a short agenda where I will start to introduce to you what Nobina is as a company and what more specifically Nobina technology is doing so that you know where I come from and what we do. And then I will show you the background or the, uh, the, the problem we are trying to solve. And then I will talk about one possible solution and maybe get some input from the rest of you. So let's start with the Nobina Group presentation. Nobina is a public transport operator, which means that we run the buses. Uh, we do that in four countries, which is Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Finland. So the Nordic countries. We have roughly 12,000 employees in total. Uh, most of them are bus drivers. Uh, we have more than 100 contracts uh, with, uh, within these four countries. And we have in our fleet roughly 4,000 buses. And we run every year 317 million passengers. We work a lot with uh, using renewable fuels and uh, of course there are more and more electrical buses in our fleets than we had just a few years ago. So uh, that's Nobina in total, that's the big things. Uh, Nobina Technology. Nobina Technology was, uh, is Nobina's innovation company. It was founded in 2016 and we strive to we simplify everyday travel. 
uh, we have the focus to develop mobility solutions for the future. So it started like we see uh, rapid changes within our industry and just wanted to make sure that we follow all these new trends and know what's happening. For example, the autonomous buses. What happens if all our buses one day to another uh, does not have to have a driver? That's a rather big impact on a company like Nobina. So that's one of the reasons why Nobina technology was started a few years ago. I will show you a little bit about what Nobina technology does today. We have uh, autonomous buses in operation for SL, one, uh, the stock one PTA. It started in 2018 and it's been running in traffic since then, uh, both winter and summertime. And it's acting as a first last mile solution to feed the main buses uh, within the Barkaby in the northwestern part of Stockholm. We are also uh, continuously developing the autonomous shuttles to take them to the next level. For example, one big next step is, of course, to make them fully driverless, which means that we don't have to have any safety driver on board anymore. That's one of the big things that's happening in the autonomous sphere. We also try to uh, hire the speed of these, uh, both from, uh, from the technical part of the bus, but also to make the routing better so they can have higher speeds and also the road infrastructure, of course. Uh, on top of the autonomous operations, we're implementing new services like uh, on-demand services. We are testing that as well in, in Barkaby. We also do some research in the scope of uh, uh, AI, <laughs> like the control tow tower and the uh, connectivity. We need to have a control tower uh, when we have buses running around without drivers in them. So that's what we are doing on the autonomous side. Besides those parts, we have two apps uh, currently in the Bina technology. One of them is Resi Stockholm, which was the first app for the public transport in Stockholm. It's a travel planner with search trip, has bus stop information. We also added these power features, as we call it, to uh, for the commuters, so you can see actually where the bus is. Uh, SL just released that a um, couple of months ago, actually. We also have uh, a power feature, as we call it, like to show the the travelers where you should be placed in the train, like if you take a commuter train or uh, subway, you uh, we tell you where to sit so you have the quickest way to get to your exit when arriving to your destination. We have roughly 400,000 active users in this app today. The second app is somewhat related but completely different. Uh, this is Nobina's uh, Travis. It is a mobility as a service platform. And we believe that this is actually the first real mobility as a service platform, at least within Sweden. But you can challenge me on that if you want to, because it's, uh, of course, dependent on how you define mass. We have at least uh, SL tickets, so we sell uh, single tickets in Stockholm. We have a deeply integrated VOI as a scooter supplier. On top of that, we have taxi and rental cars. So we get all these different uh, mobility uh, within the same app. Um, it, we launched the VOI integration just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so that was the background. What is the actual problem that we are trying to, to solve today? Uh, the first one is disturbances within the public transport. Uh, today, a lot of people 
that travels with the public transport at least think that there are a lot of disturbances, even if the numbers state other things. Um, normally, the actual information regarding these disturbances, for example, if the commuter train stops, um, you're not, it takes a while before you are informed as a passenger that what is happening and why. Uh, it's also not only due to Corona, but the crowded trains and buses that we have noticed that a lot of people, a lot of passengers, they, they want to know uh, when to go, what happens if I uh, go to work tomorrow at seven instead of eight o'clock? What, what will, will the bus be too crowded or can I run a bit later or earlier to avoid uh, crowded buses and trains? Uh, and the third thing that we have noticed is that a lot of the travel planners, maybe the, the open trip planner does, but a lot of the other ones, they don't take uh, the, these disturbances into account. And on top of that, we would, of course, have the crowded trains uh, uh, feature to be implemented so you can choose um, to, to tell the trip planner to use this input to, to give you a good proposal of uh, which bus to take. So that's the um, problem definition. We have divided this into different areas to emphasize uh, uh, what's important and the smarter trip. The passengers want to get to the destination the best way possible. It should be super easy to use the public transport. If it's too hard, we will choose another way. And we need to trust that this uh, is really a smart trip. And the disturbances, as I talked about, I want to get there anyway. You should have the, um, you should trust that the, the, your trip planner will tell you which way it is the smartest way to, to go to work or wherever you're going even if there are disturbances along the way. Uh, and safety. I, I want to feel safe. A lot of passengers or travelers, they, they will choose another way of transport if they don't feel safe. And that's really an important part to take into account. And the information that we get today, we th see that the, the information normally, it's a bit too late maybe, or with all these push messages you can get, um, uh, you will get flooded with information. So you get information about buses being late when you're not interested because you might be home having dinner, so you don't care about when the buses are late. Um, most of the information are a bit too generic. So uh, you will get like generic information about what happens in your area. Maybe you're not, you're not interested because you're only interested in your trip and where you're, when you are leaving, you want to know, uh, will my bus be late? The one I plan to take in an hour from now, or do I need to start my trip earlier because of disturbances in, in the traffic? So it, the actual trip planner needs to be smarter to tell me what I would like to know and not just the general information. And also we see that you should get a notification when everything's back to normal. It's easy to say when, yeah, the all trains have stopped. Yeah, but when are they back again? We see that a lot with, um, uh, with the trip planners for, for road and, and vehicles as well, that it's, uh, it's hard to, to get the information when everything is back to normal as well. And as I said, you, you want to, as a user, I want to see this uh, at the right time. When I'm leaving, when I'm planning my trip, when I'm sitting eating breakfast um, 30 minutes before I'm I'm about to take uh, my bus to, to work. I would like to see uh, what the traffic situation is like in the public transport. 
just like you can do on other transports. So one way that we believe is a good way is crowdsourcing. So what is crowdsourcing? It's really to get the data directly from the travelers with an app. I've added that. And what we see, the data we would like to get in as uh, number one and two is the traffic information. For example, when the commuter train stops, the user should automatically open the app and, and tell the rest of the world the train has stopped. Uh, also the crowding information, as I talked about. So, oh, today it's uh, unusually crowded on the bus. Let's inform my commuter friends about this. And as a user, I want to know uh, what about the next bus? Will that be less crowded or train than this bus? So I might skip a bus or a train to, to take one that is less crowded. Uh, of course, crowdsourcing could be, uh, you can gather other data than uh, just the ones that I have shown here. We see that traffic and crowding is uh, really what priority number one for us. But if you have any other ideas out there, what we could gather in when having crowdsourcing, just let me know. So why should we use crowdsourcing? We talked about other ways today and um, standardization, for example. And this is going a little bit in the other direction to not be dependent on other systems. There are uh, traffic information systems uh, already out there, but one problem as we see it is uh, that there is no really good standardization, not good enough for giving our customers what they need. Uh, also, there, there are not uh, traffic information in all places. So um, even if there is no public data available for an area, crowdsourcing can be used um, to fill that gap. Quicker information between travelers. Uh, today, as I already mentioned, it takes a while before the, the information about the train stopped. And before that ends up in the trip planner or even on the signs uh, on, on the train station and bus station, it, it takes too long. So if we have a crowdsourced uh, way of getting the data, we can also give it back in a really quick way to the users so they really can have a real time live update of, of the situation. Both when it happens and when uh, everything goes back to normal again. Uh, and we also believe that the travelers will be more engaged uh, and therefore also use the public transport more often, which is one of uh, Nobina's goal, of course. To get the, the users to be a part of the giving data to, to other persons. So what we see is the next generation of public transport travel system. It's a system that can take uh, data from multiple inputs, crowdsourcing being one of them. So it's not exclusively saying that we, we will only use crowdsourced data and nothing else. It should be able to take data from uh, existing sources. Uh, there needs to be an app. There needs to have some kind of smart algorithms. I will show you this on the next slide a bit more about the system. Um, of course, we need to get the, the feedback information to the users. Um, and there we see that we need both live data, like uh, the train stopped right now, and historical data like uh, that exists in many apps already where you can see that normally at seven o'clock there are a lot of people riding on this bus. It's, it's no um, rocket science to, to say that there will be a lot of traffic at seven o'clock in the morning going into the city. Um, but using that in combination with, uh, with crowdsourced data, for example. Um, the route planner 
needs to be updated with uh, in real time. So as I wrote in the ingress that, that it's like a waste for the public transport. Um, the system will look like this. Uh, it will have, as we see it, three main parts. The input part, uh, where the app, as I showed you a, a mock-up or an example or what you would like it to call it, it needs to be the challenge in the input uh, part is to create an app which everyone feels like it's natural to to use when you 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 are in a situation like a bus stops or it's late and you're waiting for it then you should pull up your phone and you should enter this bus is late so it, it really needs to be a simple to use um, app and then of course we need some kind of uh, in the the pink part here the data analysis that's where more like what Nira is doing but taking all this data from the sensors and in in this case the sensors being users and also existing APIs that can feed with what's happening in in the public transport and um, that of course needs to have some kind of how many persons need to press that the bus is crowded before actually changing the status of the buses in the output app um, like this uh, reliability things so there's a data analysis part in this uh, and then uh, the feedback part is it's combined with the input. It doesn't have to be the same app. We could use the data from the input in, in different ways. One way is to have it, uh, of course, in the route planner to, to take this into account that uh, this bus is late or this train has stopped or uh, the commuter train doesn't go at all. So you need to take the bus instead. Uh, but also to inform the users in uh, about this uh, traffic situation, what is happening at, at this moment to get uh, live feedback directly to, to the users. So we see them as three different things, even if they can be combined in different ways, of course. So that was actually the last um, slide. Uh, does it sound interesting? And I hope you have some more input for me. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Mikael. And uh, the topic is interesting that uh, can be seen in, in the chat, a lot of questions, uh, and I would divide them into three categories. One is uh, relating to Travis as, as the, the platform, uh, one is uh, generic about crowdsourcing, and one is uh, regarding the project as such. Uh, I will start with the generic crowdsourcing. It's not a question, it's more of a statement. Crowdsourcing uh, needs to be made fun, and PTUs providing services to passenger is normal, but passengers providing information to PTUs is a whole other story. How will you make crowdsourcing fun? Exactly. That's one of the challenges, the input slide. That's one of the key things, I think, that you need to make it... Uh, if not funny, at least it's good that you see that it's worth bringing up your phone and giving the data away. We see in examples in the around the world which, uh, where this has succeeded. We also see a lot of examples where it doesn't. Uh, so you, we need to give back uh, to the end user when they give us data. We need to give something back that is uh, really one of the key things and I agree it needs to be uh, if not fun it, it needs to be good really good and, and, and a good answer on, on this question may be related to the project and it's to, to be answered in the project uh, and going into the project I know that uh, you are presenting uh, this uh, crowdsourcing project to raise interest what kind of partners or actors do you want to interact with uh, when it comes to establishing or enabling crowdsourcing? What are you looking for? It would be interesting to know. We, we work, uh, we don't, we, especially in the middle part, like the um, 
data analysis part. That's one thing, uh, part that we see that we need to have some partners or get need more information. We, we don't do any, we don't do route planners today, for example. So uh, route planners is one thing and the data analysis part of it to, to gather the data in a structured way and, and give it back. We are more working on the, like the Travis app is a, an end user front end. Part. I think we will handle uh, that part ourselves. Yeah. Okay, then uh, the rest of the questions are related to, to uh, the Travis platform. And the first question is, um, is, it, is it implemented? And what was the customer's and user reactions? No, it has not been implemented. It's uh, not the crowdsourcing part. That's uh, what we, it's, this project is more in a startup phase that we have seen that it would be really a good way of solving uh, like these problems, but we haven't started to actually do it. Uh, then I will be able to show you what we have done so far, but we haven't done anything really. It's more on the idea stage at the moment. Or the plan. But, but, you, but you have uh, RIAS is Stockholm is, is launched and uh, you have 400,000 users. What is your uh, overall customer feedback? Now you mean on the Reza Stockholm? Oh. Uh, that's uh, uh, Reza Stockholm is one of the most, it's the uh, most used um, public transport app in, in Stockholm at the moment. Uh, we're, we're competing with, with uh, SL, of course, on that one. And, that, and we're trying to add like power features, as I call it, uh, to it all the time to make it better and better. Um, uh, so we have really good feedback. Um, at the same time, it, since a lot of people use it, mainly commuters, we also know that we can't change it too much. We can't just throw in, uh, let's have some crowdsourcing. It should be fun. The users of RIAS Stockholm, they don't want it to, to be fun. They want it to be reliable. Mm. So in, in RIAS Stockholm, you're mentioning uh, SL as a competitor, but if you uh, move into Travis, uh, you will uh, face global competition from players like Mubit, uh, Google. How do you handle global competition? I think one way that I see that Travis uh, compared, especially to Google, it's, the simple answer is that we know the local market. Uh, we will, for uh, as far as I can see in the future, be better on the on the local parts. We will be better in Stockholm, Gothenburg. We will be, stay in Sweden as long as we uh, see Sweden is uh, or in the Nordic countries. Uh, and Google will always have, like you talked about before, when we're talking about the standards, like Google will always be best, I think, on the overall picture. But Travis will, and RIAS of Stockholm are better travel planners for, uh, for Stockholm, for example, or within Sweden, or, and having the tickets. Like only in Sweden are a bunch of tickets that you need to have. I don't think that Google will uh, include tickets unless they are fully open and for everyone to implement. So for Travis, it's a different thing from RIAS of Stockholm. Travis is we have the tickets and you can pay for SL tickets and boy trips, and in the future, taxi and, and rental cars within the same app. So, one stop shop kind of, yeah. uh, which I think Move It is also moving into, uh, by the way. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, that uh, people want to be safe. How do you, the platform, support mobility related emergency services like uh, medical emergencies, attacks, natural calamities, etc.? We don't have a specific, um, uh, like uh, I have both apps in my head, sorry. Reyes Stockholm, we have a connection to the SL um, uh, Trygghetscentralen. <laughs> well, I don't know what the English word for it. Where you can call if you feel unsafe on the train or bus, you can call a number to talk to someone. So that's for, for Stockholm. In Travis, we have discussed, but uh, not implemented, like uh, there are other apps for it, like follow me home kind of apps. Uh, to have that feature in that you, you press follow me home and then if you 
go another direction, you, you will call a, a safety number or your friend or family. But it's not in the apps today or in Travis. So. Okay. Uh, some more technical question. Can you elaborate more on the embedded finance elements like payments from customer to specific service providers within the Travis app? Uh, we take uh, a share in between. That's the quick answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. So the payment is, is what? Is shared? The, the, pay, but the payment between the service provider and the customer. Your data sources. <clears throat> Do you pay for the data you get from other uh, uh, data sources in Travis? No, we uh, if we sell tickets, we get the share on the tickets. So we don't have any monthly fees or anything like that for the end user. And for it's it's the, the same with uh, the scooters. We, we if we if you buy a trip, uh, a scooter trip uh, in Travis, we get the share of that trip. You have a kickback on, on the tickets. Yeah, exactly. We have a kickback. Either it's public transport or other mobility services. Yes. Yeah, but you're not paying for data. No. Oh. We used to open our APIs for um, from SL and from others uh, in in Sweden, and and of course it's um, from Boy. We use their APIs. Good. Okay, that was the last question. And uh, if uh, anyone is interested to join the crowdsourcing, uh, they contact you, right? Yes, absolutely. I had my email on the next slide. Actually, you removed it for me, but uh, yep. <laughs> but you can find it. So this is an example of uh, presenting an issue, and now Mikkel is ready to take an action together with you. So please join him. Absolutely. Next speaker. Yeah, so now we're moving into uh, our business model lab and Rami will uh, take you through uh, some question polls about uh, business model challenges when it comes to data sharing. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Mikael. And uh, I would like to first thank all the presenters uh, for interesting presentations on data sharing challenges. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. Great. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Rami Darwish, project leader of uh, Drive Sweden Business Model Lab. I'm a researcher at the Integrated Transport Research Lab in KTH. Along with me, the project team uh, from Business Model Lab, Roland Elander from Sustainable Innovation, as well as Lizelotte Mulder from KTH ITRL. So the Business Model Lab, uh, some of you uh, have already uh, heard about us, but uh, for those who don't, uh, the Business Model Lab is a strategic project under Drive Sweden umbrella and funded by Vinova. Uh, today, um, let me see. Yes. Today, uh, we will take you through an overview of the lab. Uh, what do we do and what are our goals? Uh, we will zoom into some of the important data sharing challenges that are facing business models. We will go to a poll. Uh, we will pull your opinions on uh, prioritization or like maybe the most important data sharing challenges and summarize and open for questions in the end. Um, the business model lab uh, aims to uh, accelerate the implementation of uh, sustainable innovations, within future mobility with underlying all the technologies from automated, connected, electrified and shared mobility. Of course, we, we take the, this uh, niche um, action on uh, identifying the opportunities, the bottlenecks around business models that are hindering the progress and scale up of uh, sustainable innovations. So we act as an, as an incubator and a learning space for our industrial partners. Uh, in order to help them with business model adaptation, business model innovation and business model development uh, in order to reach our sustainability goals and scaling up uh, sustainable innovations. We have three main objectives that we uh, work uh, towards with, uh, within the lab. The first is fostering learning and collaboration. And I think this is a highlight when 
usually business models are done in like smaller spaces, but the lab offers like a wide space to collaborate with different partners and different actors. And I saw in the chat uh, previously to, to some of our presenters that this is a frequent question. What kind of actors you need in order to scale up or go to the next level? The lab tries to do that and we help then with more like specific cases to develop scale up scenarios and generate business model projects where we succeeded in the last years of generating plus 10 million SEC projects around business models, of course. Uh, here's an overview of the business model lab. We tackle a business model bottleneck. These are the drivers of our lab, uh, as well with the pressures coming from sustainability challenges, as well as the technological innovations providing opportunities. The lab tries to work uh, with collaborative mode, so we hold thematic workshops, um, knowledge partnerships, uh, and collaborative business model workshops. We help our partners with business modelings and also also offering funding opportunities through Drive Sweden and Vinova. Here are our partners uh, that are uh, joined to the lab 2021-2022. As you can see, we have a great collection of innovators uh, from, from different sizes, both large uh, large partners or large industrial partners who are working on new business opportunities uh, in order to adapt uh, with new technologies and sustainability as well as entrepreneurs trying to uh, take up their uh, small and medium enterprise to the next level and we're seeing a lot of interesting collaborations with electrification data sharing uh, automation, you name it, you know, all, all aspects of future mobility. Here are some of the workshops. As you can see, we, we tackle the challenges, try to map the business models, and we worked with the pandemic impacts. And I think here rose the importance of data sharing and data driven, uh, where we saw that the value of data uh, providing both opportunities as well as uh, threats and, and real challenges to, to future business models. Um, I would like to invite my colleague Roland Elander, who will be joining me now to present to you more about the data sharing challenges. Uh, so Roland, could you please, uh, without further ado, I introduce Roland. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as Rami said, we are a lab for business model. We are grateful for the opportunity today to present just an overview of what we are working with. and. Uh, in a group like this, I think it's in place to look at mainly our general learnings. So if you want to have more in-depth discussions with us, please contact Rami or myself and we could go into details. But on a general level, working with business models and how to share data and why, the questions we are looking into thoroughly are how does data sharing support new business models. What are the most critical implications of shared data? What challenges can be solved by shared data? And as you saw, the number of partners in the lab and also the type of partners in the lab shows a great variety. So we have both large corporations like OEMs, like freight carriers like DHL and Bring, we have waste management companies, as well as smaller SMEs, innovation companies like Freelway and others, which are developing digital solutions for connected vehicles. And those are all into sharing data, obviously. So what I'd like to share with you today is just what are the top level general learnings that are uh, general from both the small innovative companies and the large freight waste companies as well as OEMs. And we have two learnings that we'd like to share today. The first one is at the first glance quite obvious, but we don't think it's really worked through. And as you all know, Electric vehicles due to development cost, batteries, new driveline, etc., represent a much larger investment when purchasing, but obviously less costly driving and operating cost. 
So from a business model pr perspective, that means that we need to increase efficiency of transport work per vehicle today and even per night in order to make EVs really competitive compared to business as usual. And when we, when we look into this, this means that transport work needs to be much more efficient in order to be more profitable and carry the investment costs, obviously. And as we look into this, both for OEMs, freight carriers, which is a low margin business, and other professional fleets, we see that the investment side is closely connected to data sharing and it's critical part for EV growth on a general basis. So we look at market drivers for not just lower costs of batteries, but also increased income for fleet operators and for OEMs. So in the lab, we are now working with in-depth business models for freight carriers, we're looking at OEMs and others in order to look at the income side. And that could possibly be more of importance than actually await the lowering battery costs. So th that is one finding that we are working on and have more in-depth business models uh, in place for and, and under evaluation. Uh, the other part is peak management, and that comes with uh, two different aspects. One is obviously congestion. With autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, new drivers, means that the operating cost goes down with approximately 80% for all electric vehicles under three and a half tons, which in conclusion, means that road space, not cost for operating, will be the limiting factor. And we did a study uh, with shared data with Google, Ericsson, Intel, Traffic Stockholm and Traffic Gothenburg one and a half year ago, where we looked at ways of sharing data in order to look at congestion and having a good traffic flow when money or investment doesn't become the main hinder for, for adding more vehicles in road space, especially in dense cities, obviously. This, this is one topic where Michael at Nobina and the crowdsource data could come well in place, actually. The other implication or peak that we look at is the electric power. Uh, it is the megawatt, not the megawatt hours. And in this aspect, we see in research products which has developed from the lab that we do not actually today see solutions to the magnitude of the need of megawatts of electric power, otherwise than to look at shared data for charging optimization that, that will be a crucial part of this. So those are main findings. And now we look at some very brief examples. I think many of you have already seen Elskade Stad or Beloved City. It's a project started in Stockholm. It's a collaboration between Bring and Rang Cells, where we, during the same route, deliver freight parcels from Bring and collect waste fractions from Rhein cells. Uh, and it's optimized with a small electric vehicle. We take away two large trucks and try to optimize that route. The main challenge has been integrating and sharing the very split data sets for freight and waste. This is still a major challenge, and all profitability in this concept comes from sharing data and increase the transport efficiency and the profitability in the project in order to finance like a small city hub, which you see in the picture. So if you go to the next slide, we see that we split it uh, into two different flows of traffic work. One primary, which is in the city, 
and one secondary to the waste management facilities outside of the city, which is managed by night transport, and, and you uh, have load carriers from the city hub to, to the waste facilities. Uh, here are the need of data and also the need of setting the system boundaries crucial in order to optimize. Next example is uh, Freeway, which is a shared platform for weakest buffer personal and freight distribution. It's all about not adding more vehicles, but having the vehicles in a specific region or area to do more traffic work in order to be more efficient. And everything, regardless if it's personal transport or goods, will be based upon shared data uh, for route optimization, matching engines, dynamic pricing, etc., etc., etc. And a last very quick example is a project which is called TED, Terminal Charging of Electric Distribution Vehicles, which addresses the and stresses the problem with electric peak power. Uh, if you look at the large terminals, such the ones that all freight carriers have in Stockholm, Gothenburg or Malmö, there are some 150 to 200 vehicles. If you convert that to 100% electric fleet, the need of having data from each vehicle optimize the charging for next day's route with margin, so we will have a robust capacity, will, even if you optimize it the best you can, increase the need of electric power with 5 to 15 times, and it's more close to 15 than 5 times. So, for instance, for today, if you have a connection of 250 kilowatts, that will increase to 3 megawatts, etc. Uh, and this will go along with all neighboring terminals as well as all other industries. So, so the solution to this is actually not on the table today. It's, it's that much of a challenge. Uh, but, but we see that the cheapest way to address the problem is definitely looking at data sharing. And finally, we are looking at the projects I mentioned with Ericsson, Google, Intel, Traffic Stockholm, Traffic Gothenburg, in order to look at management for short-term traffic strategies uh, in dense cities. So a study has been made and we are now trying to set up uh, implementation projects, uh, looking at opportunities for financing both in dry Sweden and other places. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roland. Uh, very interesting results, I think. And uh, I would like also to invite uh, all of the audience to try to connect to our uh, partners work in order to create uh, fruitful collaborations. Next, we will go to our interaction and uh, Mentimeter live poll. The focus today is future mobility and data sharing challenges to your business models. Um, the areas we will, will, where we will pull you is on urban logistics, end-to-end -end, and people transport within short, mid and long term. So um, I would like to ask my colleague Lise Lotte Mulder uh, to uh, take the lead now, but please go all, all of you go to menti.com and uh, Lise Lotte will guide you from here. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks Rami. I will share my screen. And I think you all see the Mentimeter presentation now. Um, so please, as is indicated here in the top, go to menti.com and use the code 5516701 um, to access this uh, presentation. Oh, nice. I already see the first uh, answer coming in. Uh, so you can either 
uh, access this um, uh, interactive presentation from your mobile device, but you can also um, uh, access it through your normal browser. Um, and um, this first question is a test question. Um, I already see some people coming in. That's really great. If you don't feel uh, comfortable with joy with uh, sharing uh, your geographical location, feel free to uh, to uh, make something up. Uh, we will not use this data, but uh, I can uh, imagine that uh, this data might be uh, sensitive. Um, so you should see the slide and you see uh, the question will wait a little bit longer. So again, go to menti.com and use the code that's indicated here in the top. Uh, 55, 16, 67, It's nice to see that most of people are joining from Sweden, but also mm -hmm. some from very far away. <laughs> yes. And we got half the audience now on the poll, so. Please yes, enter. I will start with the uh, with the introduction, and you can join throughout the whole presentation. Uh, the the in lo the login uh, credentials will be uh, displayed uh, will remain displayed on top. Um, so yes. So as Rami already um, briefly explained is uh, uh, we will uh, I will post uh, nine multiple choice questions that are addressing three different areas and three diff different time spans. So uh, these three different areas are urban logistics, rural logistics and uh, people transportation. And within these three areas, uh, we assess three different time spans, um, which is two years considered short term, uh, medium term, which is five to seven years, and long term, which is, which is 10 to 20 years. Um, and these questions all address um, data sharing challenges. Um, and I will uh, uh, explain what data sharing challenges we are considering in a minute. But important is that you should give one answer. So, you, well, actually, you're only allowed to give one answer. <laughs> Um, which might be uh, difficult, but uh, we are really interested in what you think is the most pressing uh, issue um, in these uh, considered time spans. Um, so um, about the, so we will pose uh, a, a question about what you think is the most pressing data sharing challenge, uh, and the data sh sharing challenge challenges that we have predefined. I will now briefly explain. Um, the first one is quantity, so uh, the number of data points and the number of different data sources that are available, um, which should obviously be sufficient to make good estimations, good predictions, make use of the data. And another important feature is the quality of the data. Um, I think this was also mentioned during the presentations before, um, that the error margins should be reasonably small in order to make use of uh, the data. Uh, a third issue in data uh, sharing a third issue in data sharing is uh, data privacy um, and, and anonymity and protection um, of uh, individuals. Um, I think this speaks for itself. Then the fourth challenge that we uh, envision is that there might be um, uh, not sufficient competence in data analysis and visualization, uh, but you should also th think about the um, application of uh, machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence. Um, then the fifth challenge we see is a cost of data collection and, and storage. This of course also uh, relates to the issue of uh, privacy and, and anonymity. Um, but there are also other issues that come at play here. The sixth challenge 
uh, is a lack of efficient cooperation between different types of stakeholders. Um, and that might, so here we really address, uh, we would, we, we like to address communication challenges. So for example, uh, discrepancies between visions or views on how data sharing, sh uh, data sharing should uh, take place. Um, or for example, different requirements or restrictions that companies or actors pose on the data sets. And then this next, the seventh challenge relates to the technical uh, issues. Um, so standardization often mentioned already, um, and that these data sets of different actors might not be compatible um, in any way. Then the eighth and last challenge is uh, that uh, companies risk their competitiveness uh, by sharing the data because of ambiguous intentions. Data is very valuable and contains a lot of information and it might be that your competitor is able to uh, distract information from a data set that you were not aware it contained. Um, so we also foresee this as a challenge and then the ninth option is something else that is not listed in this list. Uh, we will have uh, a short reflection after filling out all nine questions um, and then you are able to speak up if you think uh, there is another challenge that we have not addressed in these um, eight others. Um, so I think um, that we start uh, straight ahead and the first question is which data sharing challenge is most important for future mobility business models in urban logistics within two years? So the first area that we are addressing is urban logistics and the time span is short term two years. Yeah, waiting for the first answer. Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is interesting to see that you sort of agree with each other. <laughs> but uh, as, I, as I said, we will discuss this later. And then uh, I will move on to the next slide. So make sure that on your mobile phone or in your web browser, you are following me. Um, I think if you are not on the same slide, it is indicated at in the top of your on the top of your screen, um, and here we uh, discuss again urban logistics, but now a medium time span, so five to seven years. Do you think that everything anything will change then? Mm -hmm. A bit of a different spread. Um, yes, and then I continue to the long term. Um, uh, the, yeah, the, lo the long term uh, question. So again, urban logistics, but now 10 to 20 years, so really far ahead. What do you think that in this long time span uh, will be the major challenge. And again, make sure that you are in on the right uh, question by looking at the top of your screen. If you are with me uh, in the in the right slide, you can also see it um, in the image. If the image on your screen corresponds to my screen, then. You should be, you should be good. Okay. Yes, then we continue to the area of end-to-end. Uh, -end. Oh, I said rural logistics, but I meant end-to-end. -end. <laughs> um, uh, so end-to-end -end, uh, transport uh, within a short time span. So two years, the same data challenges 
um, are there any differences in this uh, uh, area? Yes. Yeah, seems like lack of efficient cooperation. Mm hmm. And I'm happy to see that, or happy. I think we did a good job, Rami, in uh, defining the challenges because nobody has uh, indicated other yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so then we continue to the uh, fifth question, uh, again addressing end to end and now with a medium time span, uh, five to seven years. Yeah, we're talking end to end between transport hubs. Uh, uh, now we see the results. Quality. Mm. So quality and reliability seems to be an issue. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was all, also the case in urban logistics. Mm. Then I continue to the Next question. So the last question for end to end and now the long term challenge that you foresee. Um, so I can repeat the challenges briefly. Quantity, quality and reliability, data privacy, competence in data analysis and visualization, the cost of data collection and storage, a lack of efficient cooperation where we address the communication challenges between actors and then compatibility where we address technical challenges between actors. And then the last one is competitive competitiveness risk um, where companies might share more data than they would like. Mm -hmm. Waiting a little longer until we hit 2024. Yeah. Data privacy seem to be. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious about the discussion in a few minutes because it seems as if there is a, a widespread, widespread opinions. Yeah. Uh, so Thank then you. we continue with people transportation. Uh, short term, so the short term challenge you foresee in data sharing uh, regarding people transportation. So data privacy, anonymity and protection is again leading here. Mm. Yeah. We got in the chat that this is unsurprising for people transport. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I continue to the next question. So the same area, people transportation, but then five to seven years. Has anything changed or are we still battling the problem of data privacy? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting. Again, data privacy is leading. Mm -hmm. And then I continue to the last question already. Um, 
So again, people transportation, but now a long-term uh, view. So 10, 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see how you foresee that competitiveness risk is becoming more and more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on par with data privacy so far. Mm -hmm. So I think the majority of the audience has filled in the question and having a look at the time, I think we should continue with the discussion. I think the Mentimeter remains open so you can still answer the questions. Um, but I'd like to thank you for your participation. Um, and I hand over back to, I think, to Rami uh, yeah. for some discussion. Yeah. So I will, let me see how I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, nice whale. <laughs> yeah, that is a, <laughs> a changing uh, background. Stop yes. presenting, yes. I think, uh, yeah, super. So I collected the results that we received, um, and it seems that for urban logistics, um, short term lack of efficient cooperation, uh, quality and reliability and data privacy. So forgive the I, I was just filling out while you are doing the poll, so it's not super neat, but we will uh, do this more neat way. End to end, lack of efficient cooperation, short term, quality and reliability, then data privacy. Personal transport seems that the privacy is like the key data, the key challenge uh, for data sharing, as well as competitive risk on the long term. So these results will be guiding us. Of course, they are on a general level, so they will be guiding us into uh, what kind of projects might be interesting, uh, what, what is the actual challenges that you think are most important. But this is different from use case to use case, of course, uh, but these guidelines uh, from you will be used uh, in our work. And I would like to invite you also to contact us to further work on these data challenges that you um, indicated. Uh, these are four examples of scale up projects uh, that we work with, with our entrepreneurs and SMEs. And as you can see, um, electrification, uh, mixed uh, transport, um, data platforms and double sided markets all data sharing or data driven challenges. So these are the kind of outcomes if you work with us uh, that you could get. Uh, so finally, I would like to conclude with, as you saw from our results, that solving data sharing challenges is an extreme, uh, extremely important piece in order for uh, scaling up of uh, future mobility innovations. We pulled your opinions uh, on the data sharing challenges that you think between urban logistics, end-to-end -end and personal transport on short, mid and long term. And this is an invitation to you to continue working with us in uh, either like finding teams to work with or bringing in your team maybe. Here's my contact, please feel free to contact us. And I would like to thank Roland and Lisa Lotte for joining me today and their interesting uh, contributions to this work. Uh, thank you very much. I hand over to you, Mikael. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Rami and the team for for this uh, uh, go through of, of uh, questions for, for uh, business models. Uh, I have a question for you, Rami, when it comes to the uh, all the questions or rather the answers uh, during the poll. Um, I'm, I know that many people are interested in in the, the detailed report from from the polls. Uh, can you share it somehow? Absolutely, absolutely. This will be shared uh, both with you and with the audience, and it will be also recorded. But I will yeah. share it absolutely. Uh, and uh, and uh, they are free to contact you on email to get uh, access to the report, right? Absolutely, the report and also work more in detail if they would like. Brilliant. Thank you very much.
And uh, this concludes uh, the session for today. I want to remind you about the uh, open call for uh, Drive Sweden 2022-2023. Uh, Innovation for sustainable, safe and accessible mobility for people and goods. It's, so it opened May 18th and you have until uh, November 2nd to make up good projects. And you have uh, received a lot of food for thoughts during uh, these presentations today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much. Thank you.